Hi uh, everyone, uh, welcome to uh, this week's lecture on the uh, serious uh, seminar series. Um, uh, we are happy to have uh, um, with us Khaled Serag. Uh, he's a, a postdoctoral researcher at Purdue, uh, uh, where he graduated with a PhD uh, uh, recently under the supervision of uh, uh, Professor Xu and Telik. And his expertise are, of course, in security. And today he's going to tell us about vulnerability identification and defense construction in cyber physical systems. So, uh, Khaled, your floor. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as uh, Professor Zeke has just pre presented me, my name is Cal Sarag, and I'm a postdoc here at the uh, Purdue Department of Computer Science. My research interests are uh, security and privacy in general, but I have a special interest in the security aspect of networks, autonomous systems, and more generally, cyber physical systems. So today I'll be talking about how to take a proactive vulnerability identification and defense construction approach to secure cyber physical systems. I'll be focused on, focusing on the controller area network or the CAN bus as a case study for this approach as it was the focus of my PhD, which is just finished in August. So to start by establishing a common background, I first want to discuss what the term cyber physical systems means. Cyber physical systems is a term that refers to systems that were once purely mechanical, but over the course of the past few decades have come to be increasingly computerized to the point where we cannot simply conceptualize them as mechanical systems anymore. The term cyber physical systems often overlaps with the term IoT or the Internet of Things, and there's a never ending discussion on where to put the dividing line between what's IoT and what's cyber physical systems. Both IoT and cyber physical systems have information processing and communication components, and both IoT and cyber physical systems also interface with humans. Nonetheless, cyber physical systems often have more sophisticated sensing, control, and actuation components. They're often bigger in size or weight as well. So some examples of cyber physical systems include automobiles, drones, electric grids, factories, robots, dams, Navy ships, and many other systems. So like any other computerized system, cyber physical systems host a myriad of undiscovered vulnerabilities and are subject to cyber attacks. However, something that characterizes many cyber physical systems is that the way they evolved was often not pre-planned. This means that when the computerization process of these uh, systems first started, designers did not foresee them as future cyber physical systems per se. Uh, they rather viewed them as the same mechanical systems they've always had, but that they could improve by adding a digital sensor here or a processor there. So as a result, many of these gradually added components lacked any security attributes since designers did not anticipate them to operate in the hyper-connected environment of today, but in, in, in a more of air-gapped-like uh, fashion where few security threats loom. However, with the, with the hyper-connectivity of today's world, many cyber-physical systems find themselves in uncharted territory for which they were unprepared. I don't want to sound too ominous, but if you find these headlines scary, Know that they were only published in a single month. That was January 2023. Not only that, uh, they were only a very tiny portion of what was actually published on possible cyber physical breach incidents during that month. So in cyber physical systems, the breaches begin in the cyber world, but their impacts manifest in the, in the physical world. In many cases, this could cause life or death scenarios. In the words of uh, famous cybersecurity influencer, he said, in a relatively short time, we've taken systems built to resist destruction by nuclear weapons and made them vulnerable to smart toasters, which is both funny and terrifying at the same time. So a perfect example of cyber physical systems are modern vehicles. Modern vehicles are no longer purely mechanical. Uh, they contain a very large number of sensors and actuators. They also contain electronic control units or ECUs. Now, ECUs internally are microcontrollers that are responsible for several vehicle functions that were once purely mechanical, such as the engine control unit, the brake control unit, the airbags, telematics, and so on. Their functions to gather sensor data, process it, make decisions, then send com commands to actuators to carry out those decisions. 
Modern vehicles also contain many algorithmic components. Uh, in addition to the algorithms running on each individual ECU, there are also more sophisticated machine learning heavy autonomous and semi-autonomous driving algorithmic components. Modern vehicles contain both wired and wireless communication channels. Examples of wireless communication channels include Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, 5G, or DSRC. Examples of wired communication channels include LIN, MOST, FlexRay, Ethernet, and most importantly, the topic of this talk, the controller area network, or the CAN bus. Like, like other cyber physical systems, automotive security had been largely ignored until about 2015, when Charlie Miller and Chris Balasik, which are two very famous uh, security researchers, performed their famous Jeep hack. Uh, the hack was carried out over the seller network, in which they demonstrated almost full control abilities over the vehicle uh, below certain speed limits. I want to play you this little video snippet from their hack to put you in the picture. After their stunt on the highway, Rick and Charlie still wanted to show me a couple of other tricks. Below a certain speed, they can control the Jeep steering as long as it's in reverse, pop its locks, mess with the speedometer, and, of course, disable the brakes. Okay, hold on tight. Hold on. So, of course, as a result of this incident, Jeep had to recall almost a million and a half cars, which at the time was very expensive. Um, so unfortunately, the state of cyber physical systems today is, is, is still in a state of precarity, right? This means that vulnerabilities are still found accidentally, usually by external actors. The problem with that is that those actors could be malicious, unlike Miller and Valisic who are doing it as security researchers. Also, unlike Miller and Valisic, there's no guarantee that an attacker will make known the fact that they've successfully breached the system. In fact, most attackers want their breaches to go undetected for as long as they could, because uh, this way they can maximize the amount of benefits they could reap off of the breach. Um, on the other hand, people still usually do not pay attention to security except in response to manifest breaches. So that means that in many cases, the quest to find suitable security measures does not begin until the breach has already taken place. I could think of many problems with such an approach. First, uh, a defense or a patch is not always promptly found, meaning that more similar breaches could take place until it is found, since everyone now knows that what the vulnerabilities of the system are. Another problem is that even if a defense approach is promptly found, and in the case of widely deployed systems, recalls are very expensive, as we saw with the Jeep hack. Finally, most of the defense approaches that are found under such tight timing requirements often come in the form of patches or what I call band-aids. This means that they often do not treat the root cause of the problem, but rather its symptoms. This leads the, to, to the same vulnerability later manifesting somewhere else in the system, only to be patched again. But then it again manifests somewhere else to be patched again and again and again. Now, at some point, and due to the sheer number of patches, the system's performance suffers tremendously to the point where the system could become altogether un uh, uh, unusable. So what we suggest is a proactive vulnerability identification and defense construction approach. This means that we should not wait for the vulnerabilities of the system to reveal themselves, but to proactively and intentionally look for them. Additionally, the process in which we look for vulnerabilities should be systematic. So even if one day a vulnerability accidentally revealed itself by an external actor, let's say, we should still systematically investigate its root cause and preemptively look for other vulnerabilities that could stem from that same root cause later in the future. Now, when it comes to the defense construction side, we should aim for defense approaches that take the nature of the system into consideration, into consideration especially as performance. Uh, we should also attempt to find solutions that defend against several vulnerabilities at once and not just a bunch of band-aids that tackle each vulnerability separately that then that we then uh, coalesce into one big uh, thing. So now I'm going to take CAN or the controller area network as a case study to show how we can apply the vulnerability identification defense construction approach 
to it. But I first need to state why CAN is such a good case study for this approach. Um, so first, CAN is present in many cyber physical systems, ranging from drones to medical equipment, to vehicles, to factories, to elevators, and even airplanes and Navy ships. So this makes CAN a good entry point to the vulnerabilities of many cyber physical systems. It also makes uh, many of the ideas and techniques used here easily transferable to other cyber physical systems since they share similar performance and security challenges. Second, CAN has been uh, widely deployed for a long time, uh, which gives people the, the illusion that there are no more vulnerabilities to discover in it. Uh, what we're going to show here in this talk is that this is a wrong assumption. Uh, that's an important point that we want to make. Things have changed. Just because a system has been functioning well for a long time does not mean that it's invincible or that it's secure. It just means that the world used to be a lot safer back in the day. Lastly, since CAN is widely deployed, it is difficult to design a defense system for it. Uh, since taking all the use cases and performance requirements into consideration feels like walking on eggshells, right? In other words, if you can design a performance-friendly uh, defense system for CAN while considering all of its use cases, you can pretty much do it for any other system. So to start with the background, the controller area network or the CAN bus is a network that uses a bus architecture. It is composed of a twisted and unshielded pair of wires the voltage difference between which represents the zeros and the ones. Electronic control units or ECUs connect to the bus in parallel. An ECU internally is composed of a microcontroller running some vehicle control application that then connects to the bus through a CAN protocol controller and a transceiver. Messages here do not have a source or a destination address, but an identifier that specifies the message meaning. So for instance, the break position message will have a specific identifier, so does the gas pedal position and so on. CAN uses broadcast. This means that all ECUs can observe any message on the bus. Nonetheless, not all ECUs are interested in acting upon all messages. CAN is decentralized. This means that there's no central bus arbiter that allows or prevents nodes from accessing the bus. Now, how does it manage bus access in case, let's say, oh, two nodes want to transmit at the exact same time? Well, using a smart, non-destructive collision resolution mechanism called arbitration that is also based on message IDs. So this makes the ID field and CAN serve two purposes, conveying the message meaning, that's the first, and resolving conflicts and avoiding collisions, and that's the second. Now, since it's decentralized, CAN defines a strict error handling and fault confinement mechanism to be followed by every node on the bus. This way it operates for extended periods of time and resolves error in a decentralized manner. CAN has a very short message length. This makes it difficult for CAN messages to make proper use of cryptography, whether for confidentiality or authentication. Finally, most CAN ECUs have a very limited processing power this makes cryptography hard to use for two reasons, the short message length for one and the limited ECU processing power for another. So as I mentioned before, CAN has existed for a long time. Um, this has led many people to be under the false impression that there were no more vulnerabilities to discover in it because they think that all the vulnerabilities have been already uh, well-known and established. So I'm going to briefly talk about the most common and long-known CAN attacks, but I first want to talk about the threat model considered throughout this presentation. Our threat model is assumed to be a compromised ECU on the bus. We assume that, all, that the attacker will be able to execute whatever code they want on the ECU, but will be limited by its hardware abilities. This means that the attacker cannot connect devices with special equipment but will connect to the bus through a CAN protocol controller and a transceiver. In other words, this means that we assume that all layers of the OSI model are compromised, except the physical and data link layers of the CAN standard. So attackers could achieve such a compromise through the cellular networks, as was the case with the Miller and Valisic hack that we just uh, saw, or through Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or several other means. This is generally the most widely considered threat model uh, in the CAN security world. 
So under the aforementioned threat model, Ken has long suffered from the following exploits. First, sniffing. So the compromised ECU can here simply listen to all messages on the bus. Um, since it's if that ECU has external connectivity, then such data could be just forwarded to some other entities. Now, since it's hard to encrypt CAN messages, an attacker will only need to reverse engineer the format of the messages to understand their meanings. Another attack vector is message injection attacks. The attacker here could format the message randomly to see whether they could achieve anything uh, or cause any damage, which is the case with fuzzing attacks, let's say. Or they can replay other messages on the bus. A sophisticated attacker, however, could first go through a sniffing and reverse engineering phase before injecting carefully formatted messages to impersonate the messages of another ECU. There's another vector that targets the availability of the bus by flooding it with high priority messages. This leads other ECUs with lower priority messages to not be able to access the bus and to drop their messages. Now, when I first started my PhD, a new attack vector had just appeared. In that attack, a compromised ECU could bypass CAN's collision avoidance mechanism and intentionally cause collisions to the messages of any ECU and that was by sending another message with the exact same ID as the victim's message, but with a different content, content at the exact same time. Now, they called that technique the simultaneous transmission technique. To me, having just started my PhD, I thought that that exploit was not just the end of the story, but the gateway to other vulnerabilities that stem from the same root cause and could manifest later in the future. Um, I believe that the attack opened the door to other attacks that would specifically target CAN's error handling and fault confinement mechanism. And as a result of the time, I decided to apply my proactive vulnerability identification uh, approach to CAN's error handling and fault confinement mechanism. So now the question becomes, how do we systematically look for and identify vulnerabilities, new vulnerabilities in a 40-year-old standard? So to answer this question, I'm going to explain uh, a vulnerability identification tool that we've designed and given the name CAN Operation Explorer, or shortly CANOX. So our rationale behind building CANOX was as follows. Since an attacker now could deliberately cause collisions, this means that they could deliberately push the CAN controller of an ECU from the default air active state to the air passive state. Since the air state of a CAN controller is dependent on its internal error counter solely. In other words, an attacker may call several errors to a victim until its error counters exceed the threshold of the error passive state. Now, one might ask, what do we uh, achieve when we push a victim ECU to the error passive state? Well, we don't know. And that is the problem. We do not know what an attacker could gain by performing such an action, since CAN controllers were only intended to operate in the air active state and to never leave it except under extreme air conditions. As a consequence, the impact of operating outside of the air active state from a security standpoint had never been studied in the literature. So the goal of CANOX then was to see whether an attacker could gain any benefits or cause any damages by pushing a note to the air passive state that they could not normally achieve in the air active state. The way CANOX works is by placing an ECU called the node under test, or shortly the NUT, in a controlled test environment where we stress test it once while it's in the air active state, then repeat the same test when it's in the air passive state. Throughout both tests, the NUT logs certain behavioral metrics. And then those logs are then read by a log analyzer, which flags, based on the logs, the conditions where the node's behavior in the air passive state was unexpected. Um, now, of course, we have consulted the standard to identify the behavioral metrics to watch for, the stress tests, and the, and the behavior that should be expected from the node in both states in the first place. So in a way, Canox operates in a similar manner to software fuzzers, only we're not fuzzing a software here, but rather a CAN protocol controller. Of course, we later had to verify whether the unexpected behaviors that we found were due to a problem in the standard or a problem in the specific implementation of the CAN controllers controller that we were testing. 
So using Canox, we identified three major previously undiscovered vulnerabilities in Ken's error handling and fault confinement mechanism. The vulnerabilities could be used by an attacker with no previous knowledge of the system to map the internal network, identify safety critical ECU, shut down a victim by attacking a single message, and persistently prevent the victim's recovery from the shutdown. So to evaluate the exploitability of the discovered vulnerabilities, we evaluated each of them both on a test bed, then on a real vehicle. Of course, we anonymized uh, the vehicle here because uh, for many reasons. Uh, but yeah, we tested the attacker's mapping and victim identification abilities on both the test bed and on the vehicle. And in both cases, we achieved 100% uh, mapping accuracy. We also tested the attacker's ability to shut down a victim by attacking a single message on both platforms. And in, on, on both platforms, we achieved a 100% success rate. Now to evaluate the attacker's ability to suspend the victim ECU, then persistently prevent it from recovering and reconnecting to the bus, we evaluated the persistent bus off attack on a test bed and recorded the suppression rate. Now here by suppression rate, we mean the percentage of time an ECU could be disconnected from the bus relative to the total experiment time. As shown here in the table, our, our suppression rate approached 100%. Now we repeated the same attack on each of uh, the ECUs of our test vehicle. We show the results here in this table. As could be seen, we achieved the 97.5 suppression rate with the brake ECU, for example. This means that we were successful at keeping the brake ECU persistently disconnected from the bus 97.5 of the total experiment time. So now it's time to move into the defense construction phase. Our question here is how to defend against a wider array of exploits while taking performance into consideration. Specifically, we, we want to defend against not only the vulnerabilities that we just discovered, but the most common can attacks, including what we have recently discovered. Now, since we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, we first took a look at the existing can defenses. Maybe one of them satisfied our requirements. Unfortunately, can defense systems and approaches generally fell into one of two categories, both of which could not be widely adopted for reasons that we're about to discuss now. Now, the first category is the crypto-based category. This category heavily relies on cryptographic primitives, such as message authentication codes. Now, there are many problems with such, a, such an approach. So aside from the limited computation power of most ECUs, which does not allow them to perform cryptographic operations on every outgoing as well as incoming message, the short length of CAM messages presents an almost insurmountable obstacle. All the defense approaches in this category send authentication data, uh, either using the message fields, which eats away valuable portions of an already short message, or send authentication data in an extra message transmitted after every data message, which doubles the bus load and delays the consumption of data significantly. Finally, systems using this approach also need to figure out a key management scheme. Unfortunately, most of these systems use group keys, which renders the entire approach useless if one ECU in the group gets compromised, since it now can launch all the attacks that it wants, right? Now, the second category is the intrusion detection category. This category attempts to not burden the network or the ECUs with authentication codes. By delegating all security operations to a trusted, powerful node, often with special hardware privileges. Now this node monitors the messages on the bus and attempts to detect, to detect infringements. There are several approaches to achieving that aim. For instance, some intrusion detection systems monitor payload values, others transmission times, voltage characteristics, and many other things that they watch for. Now, while these intrusion detection system approaches are generally light, on performance, they unfortunately do not offer enough security. Uh, and the reason behind that, like there are several reasons behind that. So first, they usually have uh, a very high false positive rate. 
Second, they almost always detect flows of attacks and not single attack messages. This means that the attack has to go on for a while before they could detect it. Now, finally, these two factors contribute to the fact that these intrusion detection systems cannot translate their detection abilities into prevention, which renders the entire solution futile sometimes. So for instance, what benefit could a system achieve by detecting the presence of a flooding attack if it cannot stop it? Now, speaking of flooding attacks, I only mentioned them as an example, but the truth is that almost all of the existing CAN defenses ignore non-injection based attacks. This means that flooding or the air handling attacks that we discussed earlier have almost no solutions addressing them whatsoever, even suboptimal ones. So this brings us to our defense requirements. We want our defense to consider all major CAN attack categories uh, this includes injection, flooding, or the air handling attacks that we discussed in the in, that we discussed in the vulnerability identification phase. We also want our defense to detect both single message attacks as well as attack flows, and we want our defense system or approach to be able to prevent attacks and not just detect them. Of course, for that to happen, we need an extremely low false positive rate. Otherwise, we could be stopping legitimate messages. So finally, we also want our defense to consider to consider can's nature this means that for example it does not eat away from an already short message or make heavy use of computationally expensive operations such as uh, cryptographic operations ideally we want our defense system to use other unused channels so to address all of these requirements we designed a defense system called zero byte can or zb can and the reason why we called it that is that it uses zero bytes or no bytes of the, of the CAN message fields, but instead it uses another existing but unused CAN channel to achieve its security aims. So to explain how ZBCAN works, we first need to talk about the inner frame space bits or IFS. In CAN, if two message frames want to be transmitted back to back, they first need to wait for a minimum of three bit periods. By that, I mean that the second frame will wait for the first frame to conclude, count an amount of time equal to the transmission time of three bits, then start transmitting. We call these three bits the inner frame space bits or IFS. Now for schedulability related purposes, we noticed that the vast majority of CAN systems have plenty of spaces in between their messages that far exceed the minimum requirement. Now let us call the amount of time exceeding the minimum IFS between two frames, the in-between or the IBN. Now we explain the central idea of ZBCAN, the IBN. What if we make the IBN of each message a secret that proves the identity of the sender? Now, one might argue that it still would not prove their identity since an attacker could just lay low and wait for one legitimate message to be sent, uh, note down its IBN, and then start injecting messages with that same IBN. However, notice that I said the IBN of each message and not each sender or not each ECU. This means that for each ECU, the messages will not have a single IBN, but a sequence of uh, secret and non-repeating IBNs. This way, attackers cannot replay the same IBN since, it, since once an IBN is used, it's stale. It cannot be used again. What we're doing here is pretty much sending secrets and encoding them as time instead of sending them within the message fields. So the two main components of ZBCAN are the agents and the officer. The agents are software libraries installed on every ECU the role is to apply the IBN sequence upon outgoing messages. Notice that one agent does not know the IBN sequences of any other agent. So this way it cannot impersonate any other agent in case it gets compromised, let's say. The officer is a trusted node similar to what intrusion detection systems have. It knows all the secret IBN sequences of every message. And its role is to monitor the, the IBN mass, uh, value of every message that uh, is transmitted on the bus. So now know that the officer has direct access to the bus through a GPIO port. This allows it to stop messages that are not following their uh, IBN value on the fly once they appear on the bus 
and before the receipt. So to sum up, this is how ZDCAM prevents attacks. First, error handling attacks. As mentioned before, all error handling attacks under a threat model share a common root cause, which is sending messages at the exact same time as the victim. With ZBCAN, not only will the officer detect the injected message due to its strong IBN value, the entire simultaneous transmission won't take place, since the attacker will need to know the exact IBN of the message to transmit simultaneously. This both prevents and detects all error handling attacks, even without any active intervention from the officer. Now, when it comes to injection attacks, again, since the attacker does not know the correct IBN, the officer will automatically detect and prevent the messages, uh, the fake messages from being delivered, which is also the case with flooding, by the way. However, in the case of flooding, one might argue that the attacker may still risk repeatedly injecting their messages, even if the officer will, uh, will stop them, since that will still keep the bus busy. Now, to prevent such suicidal attackers, the officer may opt to suspend the attacker temporarily uh, using a technique called instant bus off that we discuss in detail in the paper that discusses ZBCAN. Now, since our solution depends on the manipulation of message timings in one way or another, we have to analyze its impact on the delay of messages, especially high priority ones. So we model the worst case response time or the worst case delay any message could experience in a ZBCAN enabled system as shown here. Next, we also came up with a grouping and an IBN delegation criteria that puts messages into priority groups based on the deadline each message needs to be delivered within and based on the worst case response time it could experience under ZBCAN. So our IBN delegation criteria guarantees mathematically that every message will be delivered within its specified deadline. So finally, we evaluated several performance and security aspects of ZBCAN on a testbed using real, vehicle, real vehicles traffic and in a real vehicle as well. We first evaluated ZBCAN's scalability by testing it on a testbed with 20 ECUs, all of which running the aging code. For the ECUs, we used Arduino Uno devices with CAN bus shields to show that the aging code could be installed even on resource constrained ECUs. For the officer, we used a Renaissance RI6M5 MCU, which offers, among other things, a CAN and a GPIL module, which we used both. So in terms of the worst case delays, no messages violated their timing deadlines whatsoever, even the high priority ones, proving the accuracy of our time model. In terms of attack detection, we achieved a 100% detection rate and a 0% false positive rate for all types of injection attacks. Now, that was in terms of detection. In terms of prevention, we've achieved rates ranging between 93.5 and 99.5. We also evaluated ZB King's ability to prevent air handling attacks. As shown here in the table, we prevented bus off and air passive attacks at a 100% prevention rate. Finally, we evaluated ZBCAN's ability to prevent flooding attacks. For all settings, we achieved prevention rates approaching 100%. Now we do notice that the channel used by ZBCAN, namely the space between messages, is present on all serial communication buses and could be used there as well. This is why we're currently filing for a patent uh, for this idea actually. So to summarize this case study, uh, the, the CAN case study. Uh, we showed how a seemingly old and stable protocol with known weaknesses could be hiding even more vulnerabilities that no one knows about. Now, these vulnerabilities could only be discovered by actively and systematically looking for them. We also showed how a defense system that defends against several vulnerabilities at once could be uh, built to secure such a protocol without it being a mishmash of incongruent measures that impact the system's performance. Instead, we relied on simple ideas and unused channels native to the protocol to achieve our security aims. However, of course, for us to leverage such channels, we first need to have a deep understanding of the system that we're dealing with 
and not just apply some random generic approaches and hope for the best. So the, for the future, we're looking at applying a similar approach to other cyber physical systems. Specifically, uh, we have we still have a couple uh, more defense ideas for CAN. Uh, we also want to build vulnerability identification tools for several emerging vehicular technologies. So I'm going to take a quick tour of the ideas that we're considering before ending my talk. So first, we're interested in exploring the idea of designing secure clicks with the ability to dynamically exclude or revoke suspicious nodes. So let me explain what I mean by this um, first before explaining why we think this is important. So imagine we have a secure click as the one in the diagram. By secure here, I mean the nodes use cryptography for encryption, authentication, or both. Now, so also we are using group keys. Now imagine that we detect that one of the nodes is compromised using an intrusion detection system or any other means. What we're interested in doing here is to be able to revoke this node's ability to participate in the clip once this happens. There are several reasons why, why we think this is important. First, the main restriction on using cryptography on CAN, which is the short message length, is disappearing with newer versions of CAN, such as CANFD, let's say. This will allow us, theoretically, to use cryptography. However, key management remains a huge problem. Since this is, since this is a broadcast-based bus, several receivers could exist for the same transmitter. So one might think that public key cryptography may be used here to solve this problem. However, this would be a performance disaster given the low memory and computation resources most ECUs have. On the other hand, using symmetric keys puts us in a conundrum. Do we use group keys? Then, well, that means if one node gets compromised, the whole group does. Or do we use uh, a separate key for each transmitting, receiving pair? Then that kills the entire idea of, the, of broadcast. Since now for an ECU to transmit a message to multiple receivers, it will need to uh, operate it, operate on it uh, once for each key. Um, all papers that discuss using symmetric key cryptography use one of these two schemes. This is why we think that having the ability to use group keys while having the ability at the exact same time to revoke nodes uh, once we discover that they're compromised is important from both a security and performance standpoint. In the medium term, we're also very interested in, in a fierce competition that is now taking place. Due to some of the revolutionary changes in the automotive industry, such as the increased number of cameras and lidars in, in autonomous vehicles, a suite of automotive Ethernet standards is now take, rapidly finding its way onto vehicles. One of these standards, known as TEM-based T1S, aims to replace CAN altogether and not just coexist with it, and the, the, the way it does that is by adopting a physical layer that is to some extent, to a great extent actually, similar to CAN, but with speeds up to 10 times the speed of CAN. Now we're interested in designing vulnerability identification tools similar to uh, what we did with CANOX for some of these protocols, especially automotive ethernet 10 based D1S. Given the way this standard handles collisions or uh, manages bus access, we expect many of CAN's air handling vulnerabilities to exist here, if not more. Mm -hmm. Finally, in the long term, we're also very interested in the security of connected and autonomous vehicles. Um, on the connected vehicle front, several protocols have been shown vulnerable. Nonetheless, most of the discovered vulnerabilities seem to have been found by pure luck. We would like to systematize the vulnerability identification process for these protocols. Now, whether we take a dynamic approach like Canox or a more classic method such as formal verification, let's say, is something that we have not decided yet. And to be honest, it generally depends on the nature of each protocol. Mm -hmm. On the autonomous vehicles front, we see another pattern emerging, uh, which is that most of the attack research focuses on attacking the perception module specifically by targeting sensors, such as attacking cameras or LIDARs, 
but very few papers address other components such as mm -hmm. sensor fusion, for example, or motion planning or mission planning. We have a particular interest in sensor fusion. Um, specifically, we want to answer the question of like, what happens if, if one sensor says one thing, but another sensor says a completely different thing? Who do we believe? We also have um, an interest in that question, even from a network perspective. So for instance, consider the idea of the secure click that we just discussed earlier. Could excluding a sensor from the click, let's say, impact the sensor fusion process? Could a sensor that is kicked out of the click, let's say, have um, less weight because its messages are not authenticated, for example? This is still something that, that we're thinking about from a very abstract level, and we'll get clear as we start working on these issues. Um, anyway, this concludes my talk. Um, thank you all very much for attending this talk. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm ready to answer. Them. I can. Right. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate okay. it. Um, so yeah, looks like uh, we do have a, a question here. Um, and yeah, uh, people in the audience, if you can put your questions in the Q and A, that would be helpful for us. So I'll go ahead and read the first question. Uh, it's from Rahul. Uh, what kind of function are we talking about when we say IBM or IBN are dynamically generated? Can an attacker figure out the function since Canvas doesn't have high computation to include intense cryptographic methods? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks, Rahul, for this question. This is a good question, actually. So, um, how? We actually left the, the implementation of the specific function open because that depends on from one system to another. However, notice that, yes, usually ECUs have limited processing power, but that's in the case that we are operating on each specific, specific message. So let's say uh, you're sending a message, right? And then you're going to encrypt it or uh, calculate a MAC uh, for it or something like that, right? At that point, it becomes very expensive, and it gets even more expensive if you're receiving, right? Because for every message that you're receiving, you're also performing cryptographic operations on every message. However, what we do here is that we, we're we assuming, first of all, we assume, we're assuming that between the officer and each of the ECUs, there are certain pre-existing uh, key pairs. Uh, only the officer knows all the, 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 the keys for all the ECUs. So one ECU does not know any uh, the keys of any other ECU. What happens at the beginning of operation is that they exchange a seed. And then based on that seed that uh, that is exchanged, and that seed is, is exchanged in, with, in plain text. It doesn't even have to be encrypted or anything, right? Just uh, a single message or two messages uh, between the officer and each ECU to exchange the seed. And then afterwards, those keys, both on the officer side and on the ECU side are then used to generate a sequence. So you can use, let's say, a hash for that. You can use uh, AES for that. You can use whatever you want, as long as this function, as long as you cannot just reverse it, right? Uh, so once you do this, you have a sequence, right? Let's say of 256, uh, 128, 512 bits, right? With every message that is transmitted afterwards, you would draw from that sequence a number of bits, let's say, it's usually in our implementation, it was between five and eight bits from that sequence and encode that in time. So you don't actually do this except after like a specific number of message, messages. So let's say, for example, every 22 messages, you regenerate that sequence for, and only when you're transmitting, right? Not when you're receiving, because you do not have to authenticate the messages that are being received. The officer does that for you. I hope that answered your question. Uh, you're, uh, Mike, you're actually silenced. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, please, uh, if there's any more questions, put them in the Q&A. Um, 
so Khaled, I was wondering, like for the uh um ECUs that you worked with, like where where do you get the firmware that that's on on those? And like, did you have access to those? Uh, and, and are they for a particular uh, type of vehicle? Vehicle. So, what we like, we did not actually uh, uh, operate on any specific with any specific, uh, let's say, model or model. Or... Like we did, we did. We have hardware models, let's say, but we don't have like we didn't deal with firmware, like because all of our solutions were very generic. Like if you look okay. at let's, let's say ZB Can, all we needed to 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 know is just like does the agent code take uh, a lot of memory, a lot of computation overhead? Then we need to test it on something very simple like Arduino Uno. If if you can do that on Arduino Uno, you can do that on more sophisticated ECUs, which. Most ECUs are more sophisticated than that. For the officer, let's say we used uh, actually an advanced uh, ECU or MCU. And that's, we use an advanced one just because that's only for the officer now, right? Like not all ECUs have to be that advanced. So we didn't deal with firmware to answer your question. I'm sorry for the long, long answer. Oh, no, no, that's fine, great. Uh, I have another question. Uh, do newer protocols obsolete this type of work? Do they build security in? Um, so actually, this is something that we're currently, um, like I'm, I'm writing a, an SOK paper about that kind of stuff. When we say newer protocols, what do we mean by this, right? Because if we're talking about in-vehicle protocols, right? Well, if you're dealing with, let's say, Ethernet that is complete, like completely switched and everything, well, they didn't have the problems of CAN in the first place. They have other problems, right? But the problem with in in vehicle environments is that they always resort to at least partially to networks that are similar to CAN in terms of their bus networks. And that is because wiring is such a big problem in the automotive industry. Uh, wiring is actually the third most, um, that third heaviest component in a vehicle after the, the engine and the chassis, right? So they like using buses because bus networks generally require less wiring. So what happens is if you're using a bus network, unfortunately, many of the problems that you have with CAN will always be present. You may avoid like with newer versions of CAN, let's say, or with other protocols, like let's say uh, TEM-based T1S or something like that. Uh, you may avoid some of the problems associated with the short message length. That's pretty much it. Uh, like I like let me take that back. That's mostly it. That's not pretty much it. That so so anything that has to do with like your inability to encrypt or use block ciphers because the message is too short, let's say, will be resolved. But um, well, key management is still going to be an issue because that's this a broadcast based bus. Well, flooding and 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 that kind of uh, these problems are still going to be an issue because that's a shared medium, right? It's, it's still a bus. If one if one ECU consumes all the the bandwidth, what, what will other ECUs do? Um. So yeah, I mean, like I, I hope that answers your question to some extent. Great. Uh, we have another one from Anand. Um, different ECUs may be different operating systems. Could your model be generalized for all of them and would it accommodate new vulnerabilities as they arise? Could your model be generalized for all of them and would it accommodate new vulnerabilities? Yes, we actually used like the model that we that we used here is the most generic model ever. Like if you uh, let me actually go back to to the, the the ECU model that we yeah. So like if you look here, like even like let me go even further like to this. So here, this is the most general generic um, uh, architecture ever, right? This this could pretty of course like this in a way 
fits every ECU in another way. It doesn't fit any ECU because it's too generic, right? Uh, but yeah, and, and we we made it this generic uh, on purpose, right? Because we don't want uh, to rely on something specific uh, for a specific vendor or anything like that. Every ECU that is connected to the to Canvas will always use some sort of a can library will all uh, and will always use a can controller and, and a transceiver to access the bus and will all always have some sort of an application code or an operating system that it runs. Um so yeah I mean I hope this answered your question. Yeah, I, I can see him say, saying, yes, it does. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. You're, you're welcome, uh, Anon. Great. You got time for one more? Um, have you considered applying machine learning techniques for AI? Uh, yes, actually, we have. Uh, we have, like this is actually a paper that we're currently do, working on also for CAN. I'm trying to leave the CAN domain though, because like you know, sometimes you get too specific. But, uh, yes, the problem to be completely honest, one of the problems that, um, that we see with machine learning and AI in this domain is like I review a lot of papers, the field is kind of saturated with people using new machine learning techniques to do whatever and detect uh, and use that, for example, as an intrusion detection system, right? Um, however, that does not mean that um, that we cannot use it or that it's useless. Um, uh, but we just need to like, I, I like to, like, I feel that the novelty from my perspective, from a security standpoint, from a paper reviewer standpoint, I get more interested in like what features you're using. What did you look at in 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 in, in let's say the, the 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 payload or like the the character the voltage characteristics of the message and that kind of stuff more than what algorithm you're using, right? Um, but yeah, we have considered using AI. Uh, I apologize for the long, inconclusive to some extent answer. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Take care. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.